Antifa, Compromat, Milkshake Duck were all 2017 words of the year. The Oxford Dictionary came up with an alternative word of the year, which was youth quake. They defined it as significant cultural, political or social change arising from actions or influence of young people. During the week in the United States, the powers that be stood around and sat around and debated uh, how they could remain in inaction following the massacre at the school in Florida. While they did that, there was a youth quake. Young people rising up throughout the country saying, enough, we want to change our culture. When I heard about the tragedy in Florida, I was moved to send my thoughts and prayers as I had done so many times before. But it became clear to me that thoughts and prayers simply were not enough. And so I decided to ask a question. When will they, I asked, love their kids more than they love their guns? That simple question that uh, went up on the notice board outside of the Gosford Church uh, was then reported in the Washington Post, the New York Times, on NBC and various other uh, American news outlets. Uh, it was picked up by uh, celebrities that I had never heard of, but got my daughter-in-law very excited, uh, and uh, retweeted uh, by a number of people. And it became a thing. Uh, the question, when will they love their kids more than their guns? And the kids began to ask the very same question. When will you love us? more than your guns. What the young people of the United States began to do from a theological perspective was to take up their cross. And not only take up their cross, but do something else as well. Today's gospel story tells us of the transfiguration of Jesus going up on the mountain with Peter and James and John and being transfigured before them. And this story immediately follows another story. The story of the confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi where Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And some say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus begins to say, yes, you are right, but I need to go to Jerusalem and be tried and, uh, and crucified and suffer under the, uh, under the power of the chief priests and the scribes. And Peter says, no, 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 Lord, you can't do that. And Jesus' response to Peter is, Peter, you don't get what I'm saying. You don't understand what the Messiah is. Take up your cross. But Jesus just doesn't say take up your cross because he wants his disciples to take up their cross in a particular way. Take up your cross, he says, and follow me. And then we are told that six days later, uh, whenever the Gospels give us a, a time, six days later, eight days later in Luke, three days later, what the Gospel writers are wanting us to do is to, to join those two stories. They're telling us that they need to be read together. So this story of being up on the mountain and Jesus being transfigured has to be read in the context of what goes six days before the declaration of who Jesus is and how he is who he is. To take up my cross and follow me. 
What we have to realise when we think about taking up the cross is that what Jesus is talking about is what the cross means in his context. And what the cross is in first century Palestine is the punishment for sedition. Uh, When you oppose the powers that be, you got crucified. And so taking up your cross literally means, in Jesus' context, to stand against the status quo. That's why these extraordinary young people in the United States are taking up their cross. Uh, But they are doing it in a particular way. In the lesson from St Paul to the Romans this morning, we hear that for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. They have received a spirit of adoption. These are the children of God who have received the spirit of adoption, uh, who are called by the Spirit to cause a youth quake, to stand up. Uh, To stand against the status quo, to stand against the domination system, to stand against the the culture that is causing so much pain and suffering and human degradation. Because Jesus proclaims the culture of God. He calls it the kingdom of God. And that is a culture that is vastly different often to the culture that we live in in the world. And Jesus says the way that we bring about that culture is to live it now. To take up our cross and to stand against that culture that is degrading humanity in so many ways. And there are all sorts of ways to stand against the prevailing culture. There are all sorts of ways to take up your cross. There are all sorts of ways uh, of being seditious. In fact, the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States almost enshrines sedition in that it is the right to bear arms, the right to form a a well-armed militia that can stand against uh, an unjust regime. That's what it was all about. I've received emails and messages on Facebook, thousands of them this week, uh, from the very well organised gun lobby. Uh, I knew they were all from the same place because they're all cut and pasted off the same website. (laughs) Thousands of them. My secretary sat there all day going, delete, 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 delete. (laughs) But these were people who believed that they were taking up their cross. Uh, They believed they were standing against uh, the potential of an unjust regime uh, through their right to bear arms. I had lots of messages from Christian gun owners. Now, not that I'm against gun ownership. I'm a farmer. I come from the bush. I understand that. But what I'm certainly against is the right of a a 15-year-old to walk into Kmart and buy an assault rifle. Uh, But these people who do that think they are taking up their cross, standing against uh, an unjust regime, being seditious. Uh, Lots of emails from Christian gun owners who said, we we have our guns because we love our kids. Praise Jesus, they were saying. But that's only one part of what Jesus said. Take up the cross. Stand against unjust regimes, injustice in every place, in every time. But then he very carefully added, take up your cross and follow me. And that is a very particular way of taking up your cross. It is a non-violent way. It is a kingdom-focused way. It is a way that embraces and encourages and and makes manifest the fullness of humanity for all. Take up your cross and follow me. And for those who take up that cross, who stand against injustice, who stand for the fullest expression of humanity, in the way that Jesus did, following him, 
then can go to the mountain. Six days later, we are told, Peter and James and John go up a high mountain apart and there they see Jesus standing with Moses and Elijah and he is transfigured before them. In other words, what they see is the fullness of humanity. And when we see the fullness of humanity, we also see divinity. That is what they see. But we cannot see that until uh, we have been through that transfiguring process ourselves of standing against what is wrong and unjust in our world, what diminishes human beings in our world in a way that does not cause more harm, more pain, more suffering. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have been to the mountaintop. And the reason he had been to the mountaintop because he had taken up his cross and followed Jesus. Uh, in a way that was non-violent and life-giving. I have been to the mountaintop, he said. I have seen the glory of the Lord, he said. Ironically, it was the last public speech that he ever gave. But to get to the mountaintop, to see the fullness of humanity and divinity together in Jesus, and therefore in all humanity, it is taking up our cross, living our lives in a transfiguring and transformative way, not only in our own lives, but in the society in which we inhabit, then enables us to be transfigured ourselves and allow our whole world to be transfigured. Bishop Westacott of Durham once wrote, the transfiguration is the measure of the capacity of humanity, the revelation of the potential spirituality of the earthly life in its highest outward form. After Peter and James and John have glimpsed their own capacity to live the fullness of human life, and seen in that glimpse their own divinity. They come back down the mountain and Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this until the human one, the fully human one, has risen from the dead. And they begin to question among themselves what this resurrection might mean. And at least part of what this resurrection means is to refuse to be imprisoned, to refuse to be imprisoned in the grave, refuse to be imprisoned in the grave of, of a society and culture that diminishes our humanity, doesn't allow its fullness to blossom. Uh, we're in Lent, it means spring, a time of blossoming. Uh, we are called to this place this morning to blossom, to live to live as fully as we possibly can. That's what resurrection is. It's to allow ourselves to live in the culture of God, to be resurrected, to be less afraid, to be more free. And of course, when we are afraid, uh, like the good people, our, our cousins in the United States, there is always that temptation to, to cause more harm to meet violence with violence, to meet hatred with hatred. But that, of course, just takes away our spring and drives us more deeply into winter. Today we come together to hear those two stories as one, to take up our cross, to stand against all that is unjust and wrong and life-diminishing in our world, but to do it in a way that is following Jesus. And then, like Dr. King, to go to the mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the glory of the Lord. And see our own glory, the fullness of our own humanity, to have our own youth quake, our own spring. 
and then to live in a condition of life that is Jesus only, transfigured and resurrected. The Lord be with you.